Welcome back everybody to another reaction video. So there's a few people been asking about this one. So today we're going to be returning to Epic History TV and we're going to be covering their series on Alexander the Great. Um, now the last series we did from Epic History TV was the Napoleonic Wars, which was incredibly successful for the channel. Uh, so hopefully this one will also draw in some viewers uh, just regarding the Napoleonic Wars series, there's been a few people asking me to cover the Napoleon's Marshall series. It is on the roster, you know, I will get to it at some point, but I just want to take a break from Napoleonic stuff at the moment and just focus on something else. Um, I still think it's a bit too soon, um, just after coming off the back of that multi-part epic. <laughs> so, um, but I'm really excited for this one. Now, admitted, and this is kind of like a strange dichotomy for me, because admittedly, I don't know as much about this period as I would like. Um, I'm more sort of Roman history, but that being said, if there's one story I could choose from history that is my favourite, it's the story of Alexander the Great, because it just reads like something that was made in fiction. You know, it, it's just so epic in scale, it, just what was achieved in such a short lifetime. You know, he was only like 32, I think, when he died, 32, 33, he was very, very young. Um, but... You know, he leads, he, he, just to me, what happened on this sort of journey was something that's never been equaled in history. You know, he leads his army on this 11-year odyssey around what we now think of as Southeastern Europe, Anatolia, Turkey, um, the Middle East, Northeastern Africa, what we think of as Egypt now, uh, parts of Central Asia like uh, modern-day Iran, and then he leads his army across um, the Hindu Kush, which is a mountain range just southwest, I think, of the Himalayas. And then he leads his army into India. And then right back around, and he ends up in sort of modern-day Iraq, uh, what we think of today as modern-day Iraq, the city of Babylon, where he dies. Um, but, you know, it's just it just reads like something larger than life because no other person in history has kind of rivaled something on that scale in my, in my view in just such a short space of time at least i think the one who came the closest was probably napoleon um but you know and as well it, the story to me is just completely fascinating because you know alexander was a much more complicated guy than we kind of th remember him for today you know we tend to just remember him for being this great conqueror and having never lost a battle and things like that um but he was so much more than that to me you know he was a guy that had a deeply complicated personality um definitely a compulsive achiever someone that could not settle for anything was always chasing um meaning rather than trying to find meaning in his own life kind of thing i think he had this in perhaps had this impression that uh, meaning would come from you know achieving one thing then scaling that and achieving the next thing higher than that so he could never be happy with what he had um also kind of like napoleon too in that sense um but also um a guy that was definitely exhibiting signs of megalomania towards the end of his life um and also you know he was also a skilled politician as well for the most part um he kept all of these conquered territories in line um throughout his life and um, also, I think he was probably just at heart, he was as much a soldier as he was also an explorer. And I think that was partially kind of like what drove him to push beyond every frontier that he came across. So, but that's sort of getting ahead of ourselves a bit, but we'll just dive straight in. So this is um, Epic History TV. Alexander the Great Part 1, and as always, if you like what I do, please leave a like, uh, leave some comments as well, get some discussions going. Also, please uh, subscribe. There's a reaction videos every Wednesday and Friday. I'm trying to get more original content out soon that's not reaction videos. I'll be putting them out on a Monday. Whether they become a regular weekly fixture, I don't know yet. Um, but there'll be some of those coming too. The first one will be coming next Monday on the 7th of November, actually, um, which will be a video about why we tell time the way we do and the surprising history behind that. So keep an eye out for that too. But also please consider checking out Patreon, there'll be a link there in the description too. But let's just dive straight in, so this is Alexander the Great, part 1. In 334 BC, Alexander, King of Macedonia, began one of the greatest military campaigns in history against the superpower of the age, the Persian Empire. 
just 20 years old, his brilliant and fearless leadership won him battle after battle. And in an astonishing 10-year campaign that took him to the edge of the known world, he carved out one of the largest empires ever known. Few men have had such a massive impact on the course of history. To the Persians, he was Alexander the Accursed. But to the West, he was immortalised as Alexander the Great. Ancient Greece. From around 500 BC... Th Just a really small point, but you might look at because this is before the days of the Roman Empire and you know the it was the Roman Republic at the time it was still a very small nation it was only really confined to the sort of central part of the Italian peninsula at the time but you might be looking at this and thinking why is the southern part of Italy called Magna Gre uh, Grecia which means like greater Greece essentially or you know something along those lines and that's because the southern part of Italy at the time was actually Greek colonies and it was only when the Romans kind of forced them out and conquered the rest of the peninsula that it really became Italian um, but Greek culture had a huge impact on the early Romans and that's partially why. This rugged land was the scene of remarkable developments in art, philosophy and warfare. Its two greatest city-states were Athens, a naval power where democracy, art, drama and philosophy flourished and Sparta, an austere, militaristic society, famed for its formidable army. And to be fair, most of the Greek city-states were very heavily militarised for what they were, um, just purely because they had to be, you know, because they were constant rivals with everyone else, you know, all the other Greek city-states, but also the massive Persian Empire that sat just next door to them. So they kind of had to be militarized out of necessity, some more than others, you know. Um, Ath you know, the Athenians placed much more emphasis on naval prowess, for example, rather than uh, land warfare, whereas the Spartans had that reputation throughout history as being, you know, the, you know, the military power of ancient Greece kind of thing. In 480 BC, these two city-states had joined forces to fight an invasion by the mighty Persian Empire. At the narrow pass of Thermopylae, a small Greek force led by 300 Spartans held up the enormous Persian army for three days. Hmm. Important to know, it led by 300 Spartans, not that there were only 300 Spartans there, which, you know, has become like the popular legend. There are actually a few thousand Greek soldiers at Thermopylae. Um, they were just, they just happened to be led by the 300 Spartans. Before they were finally encircled and killed. Then, in the Straits of Salamis, the Greek fleet defeated the Persian navy. But they couldn't prevent the Persians burning the sacred temples of the Athenian Acropolis. The next year at Plataea, the Greeks won a decisive land battle against the Persians and forced them to abandon their invasion. The next 50 years were the golden age of classical Greece. But rising tension between Athens and Sparta and their allies eventually led to war dragging the Greek world into decades of destructive fighting. Wars between the Greek city-states continued for almost a century, leaving them exhausted and vulnerable to a new rising power to the north. For centuries, sophisticated Greeks had viewed the mountainous kingdom of Macedonia as a backwater, Hicksville, barely Greek at all. But under King Philip II, Macedonia emerged as a formidable military force. His most famous reform? The introduction of the Sarissa, an 18-foot pike, twice the length of a normal Greek spear, 
and wielded by trained infantry, fighting in close formation, known as a phalanx. And that just really shows just how far such a simple change can go, like a simple change on paper at least. Because all the, you know, when you, when you boil it down, what did he do? He doubled the length of the spear. And, you know, just kind of tightened up their training formation. Um, obviously that's oversimplifying, you know, the massive impact that he had, particularly on logistics, you know, that which was um, something that Alexander did really well, but that was because he inherited that from his father. He, you know, he, he essentially inherited um, an extremely well-disciplined, well-trained army that I think wouldn't be equaled until the days of the Roman legions, you know, when it was their heyday. Um, but particularly logistics is where Philip really excelled. But it, it just shows that like such a simple change like that can wield, you know, these dramatic results on the battlefield where, you know, even, you know, an, another example to me is the introduction of the bayonet, which was done in the French uh, town of Bayonne. Uh, they were under attack. They had muskets. They had no pikes, which was the common defense against cavalry at the time. So they just kind of forced some knives and, you know, short swords onto the end of their guns. And that was enough. And that saw the introduction of the bayonet. And that completely revolutionized, hence the name, you know, Bayonne, bayonet. And that completely revolutionized um, warfare at the time because then the pike died away. You started to have just um, a soldier with his musket and his bayonet, which is something that pretty much continues today. Most soldiers today are issued with bayonets. So, you know, it just shows that such a small thing can have such a massive impact. In 338 BC, at the Battle of Chironia, Philip's army crushed the joint forces of Thebes and Athens. Through alliance and conquest, Philip had already gained control over most of his neighbours. Now, following this victory, he united all Greece in an alliance known as the Hellenic League, or League of Corinth, with Philip as hegemon or supreme commander. Only Sparta stood aside. Philip began to plan a great campaign, a pan-Hellenic or all-Greek war against the Persian Empire. Someone can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, but I think, was it Philip II? And this is one of my favourite stories, actually. Um, I think it was Philip II that threatened Sparta with war. He said something, he sent them a note saying, if I invade, you know, I will, I will raise your towns, I'll burn all your towns and cities and things like that. It was this big threat. And the Spartans just sent back a reply that just said, if. <laughs> Essentially goading him, you know, well, try it then and see what happens kind of thing. And that's actually, we actually get two modern words from Sparta. One is obviously Spartan, which means like, um, you know, unfurnished with luxuries and things like that, you know, austere essentially. And that's because the Spartans themselves had a very austere life. You know, it was very, very simple. You know, the stuff that they had, they shunned, you know, luxuries for the most part. Um, and also, I think that region that they were in was called Laco uh, Laconia or something like that, um, which is where we get the term Laconic, as in to mean like very blunt way of speaking, um, which was exemplified by their reply to the threat, just saying, if. You know, so Laconic, that kind of very dry, very blunt way of speaking, that also comes from there too. Their old foe was now an ailing superpower its great riches ripe for the taking. But on the eve of launching his war, Philip was assassinated by his own bodyguard, victim of Macedonia's brutal court rivalries. He was succeeded by his 20-year-old son, Alexander, brilliant, restless, tutored by the great philosopher Aristotle and already an experienced military commander. See, that's where I get the sort of impression that he had this insatiable thirst for knowledge as well, because he was tutored by none other, none other than Aristotle, you know, so he would have instilled in him this sort of passion for always seeking more, you know, and, and things like that. And I think 
probably one of the things that maybe drove him because he you know he really assimilated the cultures that he came across you know and he took on a lot of their characteristics so it was almost like he kind of when he came across a certain culture he would you know absorb all they not necessarily all they had to offer but all he could absorb and then set his sights on the next one and, and thought right what do they have to offer let's go see kind of thing so i think that was also also part of what seemed to be driving him um but yeah he was also raised from an early age um being told that he was the descendant of none other than achilles himself the greatest greek hero um so that also no doubt played on his mind of thinking you know okay i have to exceed the exploits of the greatest hero in greek literature you know or greek legend at the time and um you know, this wasn't just a thing that was flippant either. You know, they genuinely believed that they were descendants of these people. And whether Achilles existed or not in real life, who knows? Um, but that was the kind of mentality that they were in. So they were constantly, you know, he was raised constantly being told that, you know, he had to be this, you know, high achiever, essentially. So that no doubt played on his psyche a lot. Alexander inherited his father's grand plan to invade Persia. But first he had to secure his own position as king. At home he had potential rivals executed, then crushed rebellions in Illyria, Thessaly and central Greece. He made a special example of Thebes, completely destroying the ancient city and selling its people into slavery. In the spring of 334 BC, now ready to launch his war against the Persian Empire, Alexander led his army across the Hellespont into Asia Minor. It was the start of one of the greatest military campaigns in history. Alexander's army was about 40,000 strong drawn from all parts of Greece. The infantry were commanded by the veteran Macedonian general Parmenion. In the front rank, 9,000 Macedonian phalangites armed with the 18-foot Sarissa. These were professional soldiers, well-trained and drilled, who formed up for battle in the phalanx, 16 ranks deep. Yeah, and the phalanx would kind of be revived, actually, later on with pikemen, as I say, in the sort of era of pike and muskets, you know, the sort of 1500s, 1600s, the bayonet kind of was introduced around the, you know, it started to become the standard in armies about the late 17th century. Um, but it's interesting that history kind of has those, <clears throat> like, repeating cycles where, you know, it, it almost, like, it's like a tide, it ebbs and flows, you know, and it kind of goes back... Uh, uh, it look it, it's it is advancing, but it's also looking back and taking you know those ideas from like the classical era and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the, the phalanx was this sort of um, at the time it was the unstoppable force on the battlefield if it was very if it was well led, and if the troops were well drilled, which these were. You know, these were the elite of the elite of the Macedonian infantry. Um, the phalanx was extremely effective when it was fighting head on because it was just this massive wall of spears that you just couldn't get through because the spears were so damn long for one thing. And also they had the added, added advantage that all the other, it, it was kind of like this rolling wave. So each rank going back um, would hold their spears at a slightly higher angle. So it was like, it was just like this bristling sort of wall of spears that eventually went up to this you know, full 90 degree angle with the with the floor kind of thing, with the ground. And because there were so many, it had the added advantage of breaking up missile fire. So like archers, uh, slingers that were attempting to inflict damage on them from afar, because it was just this huge forest of uh, wood, it would break them up. You know, obviously some of them would be hit, but it, you know, it, it actually offered protection just from, because there were so many spears. Um, where the phalanx was very vulnerable was if it was caught disorganized 
um, if it was hit from the rear or the flanks, because, you know, it was positioned to be a forward-facing fighting unit, so its flanks and the rear was very vulnerable. Um, but also, it was also extremely slow, and that was the other disadvantage, um, which is why it eventually lost out to the Roman legions. Um, so it was very strong, uh, but also inflexible. You know, it was the phalanx was kind of like a spear-tipped sledgehammer. Um, so it was very effective for just completely smashing through enemy lines, but you had to wield it in the right way, otherwise it could be quickly cut to pieces otherwise. This packed formation presented a solid wall of iron spear tips and was virtually unstoppable. But it was also difficult to manoeuvre and highly vulnerable to attacks on its flanks or rear. So 3,000 elite infantry, the Hypaspists, or shield bearers, armed with shorter spears, guarded its flanks. They were commanded by Parmenion's son, Nicanor. The second line of Alexander's army was made up of 7,000 Greek allies and 5,000 mercenaries, armed as hoplites. They took their name from the hoplon, their large round shield, and carried shorter eight-foot spears. A hoplite phalanx was not as effective as the Macedonian phalangites, but still well armed and heavily armoured for the time. And you might be also wondering, why so many spearmen? Well, the spear is kind of like the musket or the crossbow of the melee weapon world, in, in that it doesn't take a lot of training to train someone to use it effectively. You know, compare something like a crossbow to a longbow. A longbow, you know, for a long time was more effective than crossbows in terms of, like, draw weight and things like that. <clears throat> Later crossbows eventually did outclass it. But... A crossbow, you can teach someone to shoot in like 20 minutes. They are not complicated weapons to use, which means that they can be mass-produced and issued to many, many people. Same with muskets. Muskets aren't that complicated to use. You know, you can give them to pretty much anybody and have them trained and drilled on how to shoot one at least uh, within a day or so. Um, obviously, it takes more training to do formation, firing and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but a longbow, you had to be trained to use it from birth. And also, um, a spear. So a spear was kind of similar in that, you know, a sword, to use a sword effectively, it took a lot more training. Swords were also more expensive, which was another factor. Um, whereas spears, all you did was just fashion a small piece of metal and just bolt it on the end of a long piece of wood. So a spear was the cheapest weapon available, and most soldiers throughout history were actually spearmen. Um, so all of that fancy sword play you see in the movies from, like, medieval um, movies and things like that, that did happen, uh, kind of, to, a, to an extent, but it was much more common among knights, you know, who could afford to buy their own swords, whereas the overwhelming majority of soldiers would have been spearmen. So that's why there's so many spearmen. The Agrianes were the army's elite skirmishers, expert javelin throwers from what's now southern Bulgaria. Other skirmishers from Thrace and Illyria were armed with javelins, slings and bows. The shock troops of Alexander's army were the companion cavalry. 1,800 elite horsemen, armed with spear and sword, commanded by Philotas, another son of Parmenion. Alexander led the royal squadron in person. There were also 1,800 cavalry from Thessaly, commanded by Callas. 600 from other parts of Greece, led by Erigius. And 900 mounted scouts from Thrace and Paeonia, under Cassander. So you can see already, this is probably the most professionally organized army of its time, which is what I say, Philip was great at logistics. You know, he knew how to organize things. But just look at that, though. You know, this is a real modern army in the sense that it's, it's a combined arms approach because, you know, Philip didn't just create good 
soldiers, he also thought about what their weaknesses were. So, yeah, you've got your phalanx, which is great for battering through enemy lines, but he was thinking, oh, so, okay, so it's vulnerable on the flank, so we need lighter infantry to protect it, we need skirmishers, we need cavalry, you know, we need essentially reserve infantry, which is kind of like what the hoplites are. So he was really planning for everything in this. And, you know, the reason that the army was so effective was because Philip and especially Alexander knew how to use all elements of the army together to get, um, to get a success, to get a result. The great Persian Empire was divided into provinces, called satrapies. Each satrapy was ruled by a governor, or satrap. Those in Asia Minor, now threatened by Alexander's invasion, met to discuss strategy. Memnon of Rhodes, a skilled Greek general in Persian service, urged them to avoid battle with Alexander. Instead, he advised them to use a scorched earth strategy, to burn villages and crops and withdraw to the interior. Alexander's army, he promised, would quickly starve. It's not a bad strategy when you're dealing with a superior enemy to just retreat and deny them supplies and things like that. We've talked about that in at length on other videos about the advantages of falling back and things like that. And also, particularly for Anatolia, which we now know as Turkey, because it's extremely hilly and mountainous there, plenty of spots for, you know, setting ambushes and things like that. So, especially the interior of Anatolia, and um, particularly towards the southeast. It was good advice, but the satraps were unwilling to lay waste to their own provinces without a fight. So they decided to face Alexander's army at the river Granicus which is an example of where pride overtakes good sense. You know, this is my land, I'm not giving it up without a fight. Well, that's short-term thinking. You've got to think long-term when you're fighting an enemy, especially an enemy like Alexander. The Persian army formed up behind the river, which was shallow, but 60 feet wide with steep banks. Their front line was a wall of cavalry, about 10,000 horsemen from across the empire. Medes and Hyrcanians from modern Iran, Bactrians from Afghanistan, and Paphlagonians from Turkey's Black Sea coast. Behind, in reserve, were the infantry, several thousand Greek mercenaries, a common sight in Persian armies at this time. Yeah, which is also something that people often forget, which is that there were also tens of thousands of Greeks fighting for the Persians at this time. Uh, particularly, you know, mercenaries were a very common sight on ancient battlefields at this time too. You know, you just fought for money, you fought for the highest bidder, essentially. Um, but yeah, that's often something that's overlooked, so I'm glad they pointed that out. These men fought for Persian gold and were armed with the round shield and short spear of hoplites. The Persians may have been unsure if they could trust these men in combat against fellow Greeks, and so placed them at the rear. Alexander, determined to attack and destroy this Persian force before it could retreat, raced to the Granicus with his best troops. On his left wing he posted Thessalian, Greek and Thracian cavalry under Parmenian's command. In the centre were the massed spears of the phalanx, its six divisions commanded by Perdiccas, Koinos, Amintas, Philip, Meliager and Crateros. On the right, Alexander himself with the companion cavalry under Philotas, as well as the elite hypaspists, the Agrianis javelin throwers and the archers. Alexander, with 13,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry in all, was probably slightly outnumbered. But ignoring advice to wait until dawn to cross the river, he ordered an immediate assault. 
he sent a squadron of companion cavalry to ford the river, followed by a regiment of hypaspists and the Paeonian Light Cavalry. Alexander, calling on his men to show their courage, then led his right wing across the river. As they reached the middle of the river, the Greeks came under a hail of javelins, darts and arrows from the Persian line. Those that made it to the far bank were immediately charged by the Persian cavalry. I love the game that they use. Is this um, a Greek mod for Rome 2 Total War? It looks like it, but I'm glad, you know, it looks it looks good how they're using that to sort of illustrate these huge movements by these troops. I like it. It kind of reminds me there was a series, um, I think it was on the BBC maybe, I can't remember, um, that you it was hosted by Richard Hammond, I think, I want to say. I can't remember what it was called. Some people might know in the, in the comments. But they used um, Rome Total War to kind of reenact historical battles, and they would put um, like groups. It was kind of like a game show almost. They put people in charge of like a certain uh, side, and was and you know they gave them the gave them certain challenges that you know would lead to the out historical outcome of the battle. Or sometimes you know they would turn things up. Like I think they did one on Teutoburg Forest, but they put them in command of the Romans, and their objective was to escape the German uh, Germanic ambush. Can't remember its name, but it was they, they used Rome Total War as well. That was obviously Rome One Total War. This looks like Rome Two, so. Alexander was in the thick of the fighting. He attacked where the whole mass of their cavalry and leaders were stationed. Around him, a desperate conflict raged. Horses were jammed against horses, and men against men. The Macedonians striving to drive the Persians away from the riverbank. The Persians determined to prevent them crossing, and to push them back into the river. Alexander's attack seemed reckless, but he was buying time for the rest of his army to cross the river, including the irresistible Macedonian phalanx. Then, suddenly, Alexander was fighting for his life, charged by two Persian nobles. Roisasses rode up to Alexander and struck him on the head with his sword breaking off a piece of his helmet, but the helmet broke the force of the blow, and Alexander struck him down with his lance. Then from behind, Spithridates raised his sword against the king, but Black Clytus, son of Dropidus, anticipated his blow, struck his arm, and cut it off, sword and all. So this is the thing, was Alexander... Oh. So this is the thing. Was Alexander reckless? By a lot of metrics, yes. He was certainly impetuous. You know, he was a glory chaser. You know, he wanted to be in the thick of everything. Um, but also, so I spoke about this when I did the Napoleon series, also by Epic History TV too, which is where I said Napoleon's successes were not his alone. You know, it's the, it's the great man theory of history, which I don't tend to like. Because whenever I do something like this, I'll always try to prop up um, others who were just as responsible. So when I did the Napoleon series, I m made mention of his marshals many, many times, which is that his marshals were just as much responsible for the success as Napoleon himself. Same thing with Alexander. So yes, it, you know, any other commander, what Alexander did at the Granicus, would be seen as reckless and stupid. But he trusted in his subordinates who were equally extremely adept commanders um, to do what was necessary and to do what was expected of them. So he had that level of trust in the rest of his army and the, in the other commanders under him to execute his plan to the latter, which is also the kind of trust that Napoleon had in his marshals. So Alexander Yes, he was certainly an extremely successful guy, 
Um, but also that success was by no means his alone, because like I said, you've got Philip II, his father, who leaves him this army to begin with, you know, so Alexander's basically bequeathed the most powerful army in the world at the time, at least in terms of like training and everything like that. Um, but also, you know, he's also been essentially bequeathed a set of extremely competent, experienced commanders who know what they're doing. So these are just as much responsible, you know, factors in Alexander's success as Alexander himself was, because Alexander was certainly a very talented commander. Um, because Alexander was certainly a very talented commander, but that didn't come from him alone. Now the Greek army was across the river, and the Persian cavalry faced a wall of Macedonian spears. Most turned and fled. The speed and shock of Alexander's attack meant Persia's Greek mercenaries hadn't even had time to join the battle. Alexander in a blood rage, or possibly regarding these Greeks as traitors, ignored their appeals for mercy. The mercenaries were surrounded on all sides and massacred. Alexander had won a great victory. Asia Minor now lay at his mercy. But the Persian Empire was still a land of immense wealth and power. Already. This is a small complaint, and I realise this series is a few years old, so it's not like they can do anything about it. But I wish they had chosen different colours, just to contrast um, the advance of the Macedonians and the, Greek, and the Greek allies against the Persians. Because we've got Macedonia in red, but then we've got the Persians in purple, and those colours are quite similar especially because they're both dark colours. Um, I just wish they'd chosen, you know, a, a, a more contrasting colour for one side so we can see that advance proceed um, and see the extent of it as well. But, like, it's, that's just a small issue. And I realise there's nothing they can do about it now. It was mobilising its vast resources to face him. If Alexander was to conquer this empire and take his place in history, He'd next have to face Darius, King of Kings himself. Research okay. and artwork. So it looks like we're at the end of the video. So um, that was a great start. I'm enjoying this series already, and I hope you are too. Um, but we'll definitely be continuing with the rest of this series. There'll be um, a special coming out tomorrow, um, because here in the UK it's Bonfire Night, also known as Guy Fawkes Night. So I'll be doing a video around the history around what that is and, you know, why we observe it today in the UK. So please keep an eye out for that too. Um, but I think we'll do what we did with the Napoleon series, which is we'll just plow our way through this um, and do each part as the next video. So um, we'll continue with our look at um, Epic History TV's Alexander the Great next time. But in the meantime, thank you all so much for watching and I shall see you all on the next one.